Hi, this is David Nice, the chair of the Nanograph Timing Working Group, and I'm going to tell you about the activities of the working group. The first slide summarizes what we do. We decide on observing strategies and source lists. We make observations. We reduce data. We develop timing and noise models for all pulsars. We create and publish data releases. We explore new data analysis techniques, and we undertake ancillary astrophysics studies using the nanograv data, that is, studies complementary to nanograv's quest to directly detect nanohertz gravitational waves. The fundamental observable in our program is the pulse arrival time. A pulse several thousand light years away emits pulses, they travel through space, and eventually reach our telescope, where we measure the time at which they arrive at our telescope. If there's a distant gravitational wave source, that's going to stretch and shrink the space between the pulsar and us, changing the proper distance from the pulsar to our telescope, and hence changing the time at which the pulse arrives. We hope to measure those per perturbed arrival times and hence detect gravitational waves. We want to do this from a large array of pulsars. We expect pulsars in similar parts of the sky to show similar signals from gravitational waves and pulsars from distant parts of the sky to show uncorrelated or even anti-correlated signals. This map shows the positions of the 71 pulsars we presently observe. The gray lines indicate areas, indicate areas of the sky visible to the Arecibo Observatory. Um, the white areas are areas not visible to Arecibo. And that becomes important in the next slide. So as I said, we're observing about 71 pulsars. Um, if we can, we use the Arecibo Observatory, the largest observatory in the Western Hemisphere, and the most powerful radio telescope right now for pulsar timing to observe them. We observe 37 pulsars at Arecibo at intervals of three weeks or so. Pulsars we can't see at Arecibo because Arecibo can't point there, we observe with Green Bank, the largest fully steerable radio telescope in the world. You can see we get a further 35 pulsars at Green Bank. There are actually two pulsars that overlap between the two uh, observatories. We've also recently begun observations with the VLA. The VLA has a particularly good high frequency uh, receiver setup that complements what's available at Green Bank. It's also further south, so it allows us to observe pulsars that we can't see from either Green Bank or Arecibo. Finally, in 2018, we expect to start observing with CHIME, the Canadian um, telescope in Penticton, British Columbia. Uh, it's going to be a low frequency observing program. and It'll be complementary to what we do at Green Bank and Arecibo. There are a lot of observations. Uh, every, every pulsar gets observed every three to four weeks and several pulsars get observed on a weekly basis. Uh, it's a tremendous undertaking. We have a lot of people involved in the observing program, including undergraduate participation at what are called ARC institutions. This graph shows a uh, typical data set in terms of when we've made the observations and what radio frequency we've observed. You can see this particular pulsar, J1744-1134. We began observing in 2004, and we've been observing ever since then. For the first six years or so of observations, we used uh, data acquisition systems or backends called ASP and GASP. They had 64 megahertz of bandwidth, and we would observe a pulsar at a relatively low frequency, in this case 800 megahertz, across 64 megahertz of band there, and at a relatively high frequency, in this case around 1400 megahertz. Around 2010 at Green Bank and 2012 at Arecibo, we introduced new instruments called Guppy and Puppy that allowed us to collect much wi wider bandwidths. And uh, we do that simply because more data is better. Uh, Guppy and Puppy allow collection of bandwidths up to 800 megahertz in order of magnitude, actually more than an order of magnitude, more than the previous generation instruments. At every epoch, we observe each pulsar at two, uh, with two separate receivers. So we get a wide band around 1500 megahertz here and a somewhat wide band around 800 megahertz. By observing at a very wide range of frequencies, we are better able to measure and mitigate interstellar, media, interstellar dispersion and potentially other interstellar effects. Our fundamental measurable, as I said, was a pulse time of arrival. And the pulses themselves are extremely weak, uh, so we can't see them. So what we do is we take a time series of pulses we fold at the pre-computed pulse period estimated from previous observations of pulsar. We get a high signal to noise ratio um, data profile, and then we match that up to a template and measure a pulse arrival time from it. 
I won't go into the details of how precisely we can do this, but there's a pretty standard formula for estimating how precisely you can measure a pulse arrival time. And for a typical value, and I'll have to admit this is a pulsar that's on the good side, we can make an arrival time measurement with uncertainty of about 200 nanoseconds, that is 200 billionths of a second, with observations lasting uh, 20 to 30 minutes. Of course, the situation is actually much, much more complicated than that. We don't just have a pulsar and our telescope sitting isolated in pulse, in space rather. Many of our pulsars are in binary systems, so they're moving back and forth, which of course affects the time it takes a pulse to travel from the pulsar to our telescope. Our telescope is also on the Earth, uh, which is going around the sun, so that affects the travel time to, uh, of the pulses reaching our telescope. And finally, the interstellar medium isn't a pure vacuum, it's a little bit messy, and that complicates the situation still further. In order to detect gravitational waves, we have to very precisely account for all these different things. And a major effort of the timing group is to model and remove um, all these different phenomena from the timing data sets. This is called generating a timing solution. And the lists down here show some of the parameters of the timing solution for a given pulsar. We generate data releases, and going forward, we're going to be doing that at intervals every one and a half year. And a data release basically means a list of pulse arrival times for all pulsars. And this thing, which you almost certainly can't read down here, is a little snippet of one of those lists. There's an actual arrival time measurement as a MJD or modified Julian day, the radio frequency at which it was observed, um, the uncertainty of that measurement, the observatory, in this case the Green Bank Telescope, and a bunch of ancillary information. We also have the timing model for each pulsar. So this is pulsar B1855 plus 09, and it's showing part of the timing model. It's um, position in the sky, in um, ecliptic coordinates, lambda and beta, the proper motion, parallax, the spin frequency, so this pulsar rotates 186.494081249 times per second, the rate at which that spin frequency is changing, dispersion measure describing the propagation of the signal through space, and in this case, if we saw the rest of this file, we would see, amongst other things, uh, parameters of the binary system that this pulsar is in. As I said, we plan going forward to make data releases every year and a half. Here's our past history of data releases. We have what was called the five-year data set, which is data taken over, surprise, the first five years of Nanograph from 2004 to 2010. That was followed by the nine-year data set, uh, the 11 years data set, which is just undergoing submission now, and the 12 and a half year data set, which we're just starting to explore. The next four slides will give you a sense for those different data sets and how, how much our program has grown. The plots on the right show um, time, so 2004 to the present 2017, and uh, vertically they show the different pulsars out under observation. The five year data set here has five years worth of data and 16 pulsars. The different colors represent uh, different observing frequencies. That's not something you really need to focus on here. And the five-year data set actually consisted of 1,095 unique observation. That means defining a given pulsar with a given telescope receiver on a given day. And because we actually collect multiple arrival times or TOAs, and each observation actually consisted of 16,000 TOAs. The nine-year data set um, more than doubled the number of pulsars to 39 pulsars, more than quadrupled the number of observations to more than 4,000 observations and uh, increased the number of TOAs by an order of magnitude. And this is largely because we had moved to using wider band data acquisition systems at this point. So we have 170,000 TOAs. The nine-year data set was also our first attempt to do things in a very, very systematic way. We had very systematic rules for which parameters we would include in the data sets. We would systematically exclude low signal to noise ratio data. We organized our TOAs in a way that was um, compatible with the international pulse or timing array standards. We introduced standardized no noise models and did many other things to, to very much regularize our data collection. Our next data set is the 11-year data set. It's a modest increase in the number of pulsars from 39 to 45. It's more than a 50% increase in the number of observations, up to 6,700 observations, and roughly a doubling of the number of pulse arrival times to 309,000. Um, we tried to emulate what we did for the 9-year data set uh, when we constructed the 11 year data set, but we did make any, uh, many tweaks, cleaned up a lot of things just based on what we had learned doing the um, nine year data set. We're just now starting work on the 12 and a half year data set. Again, it's an incremental increase in the number of pulsars up to 48 pulsars. 
There are many more pulsars presently on, under observation than this. So the following data set actually will have a lot more than 48 pulsars. Um, the 12 and a half year data set is going to have around 10,000 unique observations and about 450,000 TOAs. And you can see just comparing the plot for the 11 year and the 12 and a half year data set that there's a significant increase in, in TOAs. We're actually planning on releasing this data set in two forms. One is a conventional data set where for each observation we actually calculate many pulse arrival times at different frequencies within data taken simultaneously and what we call the wideband data release where we derive a signal TOA and a perturbation in the pulsar dispersion measure from all the data from a given receiver. So that was our observations. The, the timing group also does uh, evaluation of new pulsars. We're continually uh, keeping abreast of discoveries of new pulsars and actually occasionally also checking back on pulsars that had been rejected when we had uh, narrower bandwidth systems. When we have a pulsar that might be of interest, we time it for several epochs at Green Bank or Arecibo. We check on how precise the timing is, and if it's better than about one microsecond, then we will add it to the, um, the Nanograph program. This slide is just showing uh, a picture of a wiki page showing the evaluation information for one pulsar that we had tested the, over this past year. We also work on integrating nanograv data into the International Pulsar Timing Array data sets. The idea here is really simple. We get data from two telescopes in North America, Arecibo and Green Bank. Uh, the European Pulsar Timing Array is using five telescopes in Europe to collect similar sorts of data. And the Parkes Pulsar Timing Array is using the Parkes Telescope in Australia to collect similar sort of data, similar data sets. And by pooling all our data, we can do better because more data is good. We're also looking at adding in data uh, in the long term from FAST in China, from GRMRT and perhaps even UTI from in India, and from Meerkat, which is uh, just under development in um, South Africa. And of course, as I mentioned, we are also adding in VLA and CHIME data to the North American data set. We're also working very hard to um, go back in time and collect old data sets from Arecibo and Green Bank and combine that with our modern nanograph data set. Finally, we can try to do ancillary science. The detect nanograv detection working group takes the data we generate and searches for gravitational waves or of various sorts in that data. Uh, the timing group also takes our data and we try to do other types of science from it. This slide shows a short list and I'll give a couple specific examples in a moment. But the list includes uh, studies of millisecond pulsar distances and velocities. Uh, we actually discovered uh, a pulsar we thought was isolated. It was actually in a unique, very wide binary system. We've made many new and refined mass and geometry measurements of binary pulsars. We've studied interstellar scattering. We've studied millisecond pulsar noise properties. We've done very long-term timing of J1713 plus 0747, a super high precision timer uh, in a binary system with a white dwarf that's useful for, gravitation, or for general relativity tests. We've studied dispersion measurements uh, in the interstellar medium, and we're doing a lot of other work uh, as well. So just two specific examples of this. This uh, picture shows a map of um, all the pulsars in our nine-year data set as they've moved through the sky uh, over the last five, five million years. Uh, this study was made by measuring their proper motions, that is, their angular motion across the sky, and measuring their distances, both for using nanograv data. And then we did a statistical study of those velocities, and what we found was that millisecond pulsars generally have space velocities that are very similar to other very old uh, galactic populations. So it seems like millisecond pulsars, unlike young pulsars, uh, have not been given big kicks at birth. We found that there are a few exceptions, but most pulsars seem to follow that pattern, which is an interesting uh, result. I also mentioned earlier binary studies. So uh, binary modeling binary systems, which we have to do in order to eventually detect gravitational waves, sometimes involves looking for relativistic effects. For example, uh, the pulses might travel through the companion well, the, I'm sorry, through the potential well of the binary companion, and since the potential well stretches space, the pulses actually take longer to arrive at our telescope. We can use that to measure the mass of the companion star and the geometry of the orbit, and from those two things we can infer the mass of the pulsar. This plot from a recent nanograv publication is showing um, the allowed values of pulsar mass for one particular pulsar, J1614 minus 2230, and what we see is that the mass of that pulsar, that neutron star, is right around 1.92 solar masses, give or take uh, a couple hundredths of a solar mass. 
We're also measuring the mass of the white dwarf companion around 0.492 or 0.493 solar masses, and we're measuring the geometry of the orbit here, just quantified as the cosine of the inclination angle. Okay, I hope you've appreciated this brief summary of what the Nanograv Timing Working Group does. You can find more about us on the Nanograv Wiki, and we have weekly telecons, and everybody is uh, invited to join in. So thank you very much.